Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. It is Tuesday. It is week 10. It is the spring of 2021. This lecture, three very important topics. Atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia, and myocardial infarction. These are the, f the two most common causes of a supraventricular tachycardia. In other words, you wake up one morning or wake up in the middle of the night and your heart is racing 180 beats, 200 beats a minute. This is usually the cause, number one and number two. And then, of course, myocardial infarction needs no introduction. So off we go. Let's talk about AVRT first. Atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. Sometimes it's called reentrant. Sometimes it's called reciprocal tachycardia as well. I didn't add that AKA, but reciprocal tachycardia. And it is the second most common supraventricular tachycardia. It is commonly seen in patients with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. Uh, patients with Longuedon levine syndrome can also have it. So these are the patients with accessory conduction pathways that we talked about last time. Right, so typically we're just going to kind of go with the theme that the patient has an innocent little heart murmur called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and every now and then it goes crazy and goes into this super running fast heart. What causes it? Well, this is why we talked about ectopic foci because AVRT and AVNRT are both caused by a perfectly placed and perfectly timed ectopic foci. And it could be in the atria or it could be in the ventricles. We didn't talk about ventricular ectopic foci, but they're exactly the same. Uh, PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, are basically the same theory. Everything kind of goes the same as, uh, as atrial ectopic foci or PACs premature atrial contractions. So a perfectly placed ectopic foci knocks out either the Wolf-Parkinson-White current, which we talked about last time, or the SA node current. And if one current is knocked out, no collision occurs. Normally we have a collision snuffing the two currents out. And so the surviving current is able to run completely backwards through the James fibers of a patient with a Wolf Parkinson White. Now, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should go watch the last video, which is either um, on my main channel. It's probably the last one is on Professor Doug's lecture page. Um, but yeah, so that's it. The surviving current runs backwards through the atria via the Kent fibers. When you run backwards, is an important concept, when you run backwards through fibers or the AV node, when you go backwards, that's called retrograde conduction. So the current goes retrograde conduction uh, through the Kent fibers. There's one rare form of AVRT that actually goes normally through the Kent fibers. That's called anterograde conduction. But at re bottom line, is it, re it results in a looping type of current called a reentry circuit or a reentrant circuit. And that looping current can make the heart go really, really fast. There's actually two flavors of AVRT we should talk about. By far the most common is orthodromic AVRT. Uh, that occurs when the current runs the normal direction through the AV node. Even though it's running fast and it's looping, um, it's an anterograde current, and that's normal direction. Um, that's probably 95% of the time, depending on what literature you look at, 90 to 95% of the time the patient has an orthodromic AVRT. Antidromic AVRT, it's easy, fairly easy to spot and it's dangerous. Um, it runs retrograde, goes backwards through the AV node. If you run a current backwards through the AV node, the slowdown portion of the AV node doesn't work. So you could get ventricular contraction rates or heart rates of like 300 beats per minute. I mean, you could kill somebody really fast with this condition. All right, so let's talk, let's expand on that. Let's talk about the orthodromic first. 
So you can read through it here, but let me just go through it. So here we have an SA node depolarizing, and the current is going the normal directions. And I made this one in white so we can see what happens to it. Because here's a patient with Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, and they have Kent fibers that allow the atria to communicate with the ventricles. You're not supposed to have that. It's supposed to be electrically insulated. Um, so you can get a current, and you do get a current, we'll call it the WPW current, going through these Kent fibers. Now they're not going to go very fast because there's no super fast conduction. There's no bundle of hiss. There's no bundle branches for the current. But it can still propagate rather slowly, but it can still make its way through the, uh, through the ventricles. And that causes the delta wave. Remember last time we talked about the delta wave. Um, and normally what happens, the normal current, it gets slowed down in the AV node, but then it's unleashed and it flies through the conduction system, the Purkinje system, so fast that usually in this scenario, a collision between the currents would occur right here, and it would snuff out the current normally. Okay, that was Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. But what happens if you have a perfectly placed PVC, premature ventricular complex, or an ectopic foci that occurs just in the right place and just at the right time. Uh, well, this current would snuff out, it would collide with the Wolf-Parkinson-White current, and if the timing is just right, it would collide with the SA node current. So it has to be a perfect storm. If it occurs just before these two are getting ready to uh, to occur, well, no, it doesn't, I'm sorry, it doesn't have to be a perfect storm. Um, I mean, it could snuff each other out, that would be great, and you wouldn't have a ventricular tachycardia. But if it, if it occurred right before the Kent fiber current, or the, the Wolf-Parkinson-White current, if it snuffed that current out before the SA node current arrived, then there's nobody to snuff out this current. That's the point, right? So the PVC has to occur uh, just as the Kent fibers. I probably should have moved it so it's more so it's more in this direction right here, because it has to occur right when the Kent fibers or when, right when the SA node current or the Wolf-Parkinson White current goes through the Kent fibers, and then this current is no more. Then there's nobody to stop the SA node current, the regular current, and that current can go right back up backwards, a retrograde, through the Kent fibers. And the current will split right when it gets out. Half of the current will go knock out the SA node, so that's not going to be a pacemaker. The other current will find its way into the AV node, and the circuit runs again. But this time, there is no SA node generated current. So there's no Wolf-Parkinson-White current anymore. This, this loops around and around and around and around. Um, and the authors are all over the place on the average heartbeat, but it's probably about 200 to 225 beats per minute. And that's the ventricles running that fast. This is not a sustainable tachycardia. You'll start to get chest pain after a while. Uh, because the heart will become ischemic. And so that is orthodromic AVRT caused by an action potential snuffing out just the Wolf-Parkinson-White current. And not as I first said. If it snuffs both of them out, no harm, no foul. Um, it'll just, you'll go back into the, the Wolf-Parkinson-White mode again. But if it snuffs out the Kent fibers, um, or the Kent fiber current here, or the the Wolf-Parkinson-White current, whatever you want to call it, there's nobody to stop this current from going. Okay? So that is orthodromic AVRT. So play that back, think about it. And yeah, it's the most common current. Um, we said, I need to add this in, I always forget, but uh, it's probably about 90 to 95 percent of the time this is the current that is seen or this is the type of AVRT that there is. 
right? And it means that, so these are the test things I can test yet, it means that the current is running through the AV node anterograde. So you have anterograde conduction in orthodromic AVRT. That means the normal direction, I'm not going to say the normal direction, I'm going to say either retrograde is backwards or anterograde, just to make sure you understand those two words. All right? Um, yeah, it's not going to go crazy, though, because the slowdown portion is working. So, And I might, my definition of crazy is anything over 300. 400 is just super fast and deadly. So it's not going to do that. We set it r around 225 beats per minute. Now another story. So it's kind of similar, but this is antidromic AVRT. So this time, the SA node current is the one who gets snuffed out. So here's an SA node depolarizing and the current is flowing over here. But the current that usually goes into the AV node, it gets taken out right here by a perfectly placed and perfectly timed premature atrial complex or contraction or depolarization. So that means for this heartbeat, nothing is going down the AV node. There is no SA node current. Uh, but it doesn't take out the current going this way. So the Wolf-Parkinson-White current arrive, kind of arises as normal. Normally it would be snuffed out right here, but there's nobody to snuff it out because our main SA node current was taken out here. And it doesn't have to be here. You could have a PJC occur in here and take out the current. So it collides with the current and you don't get... Uh, anything that stops the current from going this way to snuff out the WPW current will do it. If nobody's there to snuff out the WPW current, then it gets into the Purkinje system and races backwards. And it goes retrograde through the AV node and emerges. It splits here. It goes knocks out the SA node. So that doesn't work anymore. And the rest of it goes right back down the Kent fibers. And so you could get this racing of current. There's moderate fibers I didn't draw, but you can get this racing of current uh, going around like this. And the key is it's going backwards or retrograde through the AV node. And I said that the slowdown portion of the AV node will not work if the current is running backwards through it. So we got a re-entry. What does re-entry mean? It's atria to ventricles re-entering the atria. That's a re-entry tachycardia. And this one is extremely dangerous. What's the average heart rate? The authors are all over the place, but somewhere between 300 and 400 beats per minute. Um, some authors say a little bit lower, but it can be all over the place. Uh, you run your heart that fast, and you're not going to live very long. It's going to wreck your heart because that the blood's not going to be coming out of the heart very good, and your heart's going to become ischemic and stop working, and your brain's going to become ischemic in your liver. Um, so this is a very dangerous current. All right, so back to AVRT. Uh, in general, fun facts. Um, so about 50% of patients who have Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome will at some point develop AVRT, usually after a hard night of drinking is the first time it shows up, or some type of severe stress. About 20% of patients who go into AVRT, it can actually morph into atrial fibrillation, and that's a more serious. We talked about how that can throw arterial blood clots and throw arterial emboli, cause all sorts of trouble, like a stroke. What are the EKG findings for orthodromic, uh, orthodromic AVRT? The ventricles typically run about 225. I mean, authors are all over the place on that. Um, it's a narrow, here's the key. It's a narrow complex tachycardia, meaning the QRS complex, the width of that is less than point, point 0.10 millimeters, or seconds, sorry, point 0.10 seconds. Okay, or 2.5 little boxes. So we've seen, that, that's all we've talked about so far. Everything we've talked about has been narrow, complex tachycardias. Where's the P wave? Well, P wave might be hidden behind the QRS complex. It could be 
in the S wave, the up limb of the S wave, and slur it. We saw how a a junctional tachycardia can slur the F, S wave, and we've actually introduced these terms already because I said a junctional tachycardia can be tough to tell apart from AVRT and even AVNRT. And when I say AVRT, and when you see a question on boards that says AVRT, and they don't they don't specify whether it's orthodromic um, or antidromic, assume it's orthodromic, okay, because it's so much more common. And that's the same on my test. If you see AVRT, I'm talking about orthodromic AVRT. So the P wave could be anywhere. It could slur the S wave. It might even be notched all the way in the T wave. It can be anywhere. Right? The morphology, typically, if it's in, comes from the right atria, the it's upright. Um, let me see. Is that the wrong P wave morphology? Oh, I see. Though it depends where the hole is. I was going to say this is not a ectopic foci. It depends where the hole is in the fiber skeleton. I showed you one in the right atria. Um, and so those P waves, when you see them, are typically upright. Right is upright. If the hole in the fiber skeleton is in the left, uh, between the left and right atria, uh, in the left fiber skeleton, then it's going to be inverted. Right? There will be no delta wave, and this is a narrow complex, t uh, narrow complex tachycardia. QRS complex is narrow. Again, it could slur the up limb of the S wave, just like AVRT. Um, I'm sorry, just like AVNRT, that should say. Slide 12 should have an N right there. Whoops. Just like AVNRT. All right. Oh, there's AVNRT. So the um, AVRT also slurs the up wave, just like that would be a junctional tachycardia, um, and just like AVNRT. Sorry about that. Just made a couple of these slides today. Uh, it's typically much faster than a junction. We said the junctional tachycardia is typically a slow poke. Runs around 120 beats or so. AVRT, it can, I mean, it can be. A, it, it's not going to be 120 beats per minute. That would be very unusual. Um, it's, it could be 170, it could be 200, it could be 225, it could be 300. But it's much faster, the point is, than junctional tachycardia. I've said that several times, so that's how I'll, on the test, I'll differentiate between the two. Here's an example of orthodromic AVRT, um, and the P wave is way late. And so we have a heart running at, uh, after adenosine was given in this patient, it's just a cartoon story, but... Heart rate's 170 beats per minute after adenosine, and we can see the heart, the the T wave. There's no P wave. The QRS complex is narrow, and the P wave is way late. So that's one possibility. Um, a junctional tachycardia could do that, but it's too fast. Junctional tachycardia is typically around 120, 30, maybe 140 beats per minute. There's no delta wave here. Um, the P wave is inverted, so this is coming from the a hole in the left fibrous skeleton. See how that works. All right, here's a 55-year-old who comes in for a pre-employment physical. Uh, she says, or he says that he's in great health. You run an EKG, he's not in great health, is he at all? And this is not from anxiety. So what's the speed is the first thing we look at. Well, the RR intervals are the first thing we look at. Make sure it's it's not um, irregularly irregular. Uh, but no, it's not. They're fairly even. How fast is the heart rate going? Um, well, we can pick any one of these. Let's pick this one as almost on that line. That would be 300. Uh, that would be 150. So it's well over 150. It's probably 170-ish, just kind of eyeballing it. Uh, we have a T wave. Where's the P wave? Don't really have a P wave, do we? Or do we have it notched somewhere? I'm looking to see if there's a notch or a slurring of the S wave here. I don't see any slurring of the S wave. Yep, so it's probably hidden here. 
Um, so this is a tachycardia. It's too fast for a junctional tachycardia. So this is most likely AVRT, or it could be AVNRT as well. I could never ask you both of those questions because they look too similar. So it's going 180 beats per minute. It's a narrow complex tachycardia. Tachycardia is under uh, under 0.10 seconds. It's under 12 seconds is some authors say 12 is normal. I need to straighten that because I'm kind of flipping that term, aren't I? Uh, but it's it's about 0 0.08, so it's a narrow complex tachycardia. Uh, best diagnosis would be AVRT, but AVR NRT can be look just like this as well. It's too slow for a junctional tachycardia. See how that works? Treatment is the same uh, for all of these. Antidromic you have to be careful with. Orthodromic is the regular. You try Valsalva's maneuvers, vagal maneuvers, then adenosine, then cardioversion, um, and then, uh, I mean, ablation, if it keeps coming back, you might have to try to ablate it. Uh, maintenance medications, typically metropolol. Antidromic AVRT, very dangerous macro uh, entry. Uh, these are considered macro entry too. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we looked at a micro entry uh, uh, with uh, was it was it uh, eat ectopic atrial tachycardia. We talked about how a dead area of myocardial tissue can get a little micro reentry tachycardia loop going, tachycardic loop going. Um, this loop is much bigger, so these are called macro reentry circuits. Um, this one can run fast enough to cause quick myocardial ischemia and death of the heart tissue, which of course would kill you. Um, um, it again occurs when the normal SA node current is knocked out by a perfectly timed and perfectly placed ectopic foci, which is usually in the atria, but it could be in the junctional region as well. And the Wolf-Parkinson-White current has no nobody to knock it out, so it runs backwards or retrograde through the AV node, splits, half of it knocks out the SA node, the other half goes back down the Kent fibers, and we get a racetrack like we already talked about. And, um, yep, there's the racetrack. I left that in here, everything we just said. And, yep, that's the racetrack going around. Could have taken these slides out. So why is this one dangerous? Well, if you run backwards or, or retrograde through the AV node, there's nothing to slow you down. And there's no slowdown mechanism. If you run the normal direction or anterograde, then you're going to get slowed down. Uh, but these heart rates can be, can be much faster uh, than, than AVRT. And, and therefore, if your heart is running 300 beats per minute, you're not going to live long because not much blood is coming out. And not much blood is getting back to the heart to supply it, the muscle, from working that fast. So kind of a vicious cycle, and the heart starts to die. Now here's the EKG findings. This one, antidromic AVRT, you can tell apart uh, from a junctional tachycardia, and you can tell it apart uh, from orthodromic AVRT. And here's the key. It's typically a wide complex tachycardia. The, the length, the span of the QRS complex is way greater than 0.12, which is normal. 0 0.20, uh, 0 0.30, 40. It can be really, really wide. And that's because the Wolf-Parkinson-White current is not using the Purkinje fibers, the Purkinje system, and it goes slow. I mean, slow is a relative term, right? It can still run 300 beats per minute, but it can't go 500 beats per minute. Um, so it gives you a very long and drawn-out QRS complex. The delta wave could be visible in some cases. That's what the authors say. I've never seen that. but um, And yeah, so EKG findings, you have this really wide and bizarre-looking QRS complex. And, uh, yeah, it can be huge, as we'll see here in a second. What about the P wave? Uh, P wave typically won't be as late, um, but it can still be late. Uh, the T wave can be notched in the QRS complex. It could be slur the S wave. I mean, really, the P wave can do the same thing 
that a junctional tachycardia and AVRT can do, or AVNRT can do. Let's look at a case. See what I mean? You guys have never seen anything like that. It looks like ventricular tachycardia, and it can be confusing with that. I have YouTube videos on that, but I had to take some of the stuff because we have to save some room for at least one lung lecture. Um, but yeah, so here's a 45-year-old comes in to your tent. You're working a marathon, uh, taping up people and just helping out, general medical tent. Uh, and they're complaining they can't catch the breath, and they've it's been like an hour after the race. So you pull out an e twelve, or you run a, a twelve lead EKG tracing. What do you think? Well, it's not irregular, irregular, or irregularly irregular. What's the speed of this thing? We can use this right here. That's right on the second divot. So that's three. If the other R wave would have been here, the peak of the R wave, that would have been 300. So it's almost 300 beats per minute. This is a very, very dangerous tachycardia here. Can't live like this too long. And then look at the QRS complex. So, well, this is, this is the Q. Here's the R. And this big thing here is the S wave. And then that's the T wave, right? And if we look close, we can even see a little notch. It's subtle, but we can see the P wave notched in the up limb of the S wave. There's another one there. Okay, it looks like it's inverted, so it's the, the hole in the fiber skeleton is probably on the left side. See how that works? But you've never seen anything like that, so that's no good. So it's about 250 beats per minute. Um, that's no good. You can't live too long like that. You damage your heart. Call the ambulance over and everything else I said. Let's do another one. 17-year-old comes into the emergency room after football. Mom brings him in. He can't catch his breath. 17 years old. What do you think? Just showed you limb lead too. Well, it looks like the same thing, doesn't it? Again, this looks similar to ventricular tachycardia, which is really dangerous, um, but it's not ventricular tachycardia. Uh, but it's a really, really wide QRS complex. Um, the heart is going, this one's almost on the, on the grid here. Um, so it's, let's see, where's a better one I can get? Yeah, it's over 150 beats per minute. So no good. So tachycardia. When this, or, there's only one you know uh, that can do this, and that's antidromic AVRT. Here's the kind of the players. So there's the Q wave. The Q wave use. I mean, I guess technically, this is below the isoelectric line. Um, but the R wave. This is one of those cases where you don't really have a Q wave. You just have an R wave. There's the up limb, down limb, the down limb of the S wave, the up limb of the S wave. You might have right there, it looks like the P wave is notched right there. And there's the T wave. And then the whole process starts again. No P, definitely no P wave. Okay, we even have it this time, it looks like it's notched right here. So, yep, that's antidromic AVRT with a heart rate of, um, calculated at 188 beats per minute. So that's not a good thing. All right, just a final warning about antidromic AVRT. You think you just do the same for, with regard to treatment. You can't do the same treatment with these patients. Um, if you try to do vagal maneuvers or give them adenosine or any other drug that, uh, that tries to slow down the AV node, because it's running backwards through the AV node, the current, it'll make the current faster. Uh, and it could, I mean, they could go into ventricular tachycardia following this. So... You have to be really good at recognizing this and knowing not to give adenosine. Don't do any vagal maneuvers. See, this is why chiropractors should should never do vagal maneuvers on somebody uh, unless you have some decent skills on EM on EKG. And never do it without an EKG. Maybe they're in maybe they're an antidromic AVRT. You kill the patient. 
So this should be done in the ER department. Um, instead, they use uh, another type of uh, heart slowing down drug, uh, this pro uh, uh or you could do go right to electrocardioversion and treat them like that. All right, now let's get to AVNRT, which I didn't make it to last quarter. And these, I mean, we got a lot of slides today, but there's a lot of pictures too. But I really wanted to get AVNRT in there. So this is the number one cause of supraventricular tachycardia. If you go out drinking and on Friday night, maybe Saturday, maybe Sunday, maybe Monday, um, you may suffer a tachycardia. This is probably it if you're young. These are seen in healthy hearts uh, without any organic disease. Um, they are considered a benign pesky arrhythmia, but they can be troublesome if they go if they go and they can't be controlled. You have to be able to get these the heart back into normal rhythm, or they can go fast enough to damage the heart. But it is not as concerning as the other ones we've looked at. Um, this time, it's a problem with the AV node. Specifically, recall the AV node has one approach track usually. And about 20% of people, that 20 is a common number, isn't it? That's the same for uh, people with a pro patent for amyloid valleys, 20%. Um, about 20% of the people actually have two approach tracks. Um, and the range is 10 to 35, depending on the research, though. So you have a fast approach track to the AV node and a slow approach track to the AV node. And here's the classic example. So normally most people would have this, and it's, they're exaggerating this. I mean, these would be much shorter than this. These are stubby little things to my understanding. They would look like this, not so big like this. Uh, but normally you just have this one. And you don't have this slow one over here, but about 20% have this slow track. And it's a weird track. Because it's with regard to conduction speed, it's slow, but with regard to repolarization and resetting so it can receive another action potential, it's super fast, way faster than the fast track. Um, so that's the important phenomenon, and it has to repolarize super fast, and your fast track has to repolarize slow. If you have that set up, then you have a perfect storm, a perfect setup. To develop AVNRT. All right here's another uh, picture. Um, this is all the. This is that view. I, I think I cut a lot of the anatomy slides out of here, but this is a view of the right atrium, uh, where you can see the tendon of torado. You can see the fast tract. You can see the slow tract. Um, I mean, you can't see histologically. You would be able to. There's no. I mean, they're not. It's not green and blue in your heart, but this is just where it's located. Um, there's conscious triangles right up at the tip that all this stuff is happening. And these are exaggerated. Again, they're not this long. That's where they live. So what is the physiology? How does this, what happens in normal people if you have two of tracks? So the fast tract is going to grab the SA node generated action potential. Um, and it's going to, I mean, they're both going to grab it. The SA node will send action potentials which will re reach the fast and the slow tract. But the fast tract is fast and the, conduct, the, the action punch potential will zip down the end of that fast tract and go on to, to, to go through the AV node. It kind of wins. But the same kind of scenario, half of it breaks off and the slow tract is slow, slow. It can actually go retrograde up the slow tract. And that's exactly what it does. Um, it goes backwards through the slow tract and snuffs it out. Let's take, where's the picture? Here's a picture. So this is what usually happens. The SA node generates a current. Let's change my color to blue. So there's Bachmann's bundle. Yeah, these are the ones that usually hit the AV node, these, these currents. They're inner atrial nodal pathways they can go. Um, but both of the SA node current gets in here. And great, but this one is so fast, it gets down to the end lickety-split. 
This one is like a turtle and only gets about this far before this one is at the end. The current then splits. Half of it goes down to pace the heart. The other half goes back up this way. It says, oh, look, here's some fairly fast fibers. Let's go up here. And the two currents collide and snuff each other out. So similar to AVRT in a way, how the Wolf, Parkinson, White, and the SA no current snuff each other out. Um, and so that goes on every single heartbeat, and the, those affected will probably not even know this is happening. But can you see where I'm going with this? What happens if a perfectly placed, a perfectly placed PAC occurs right here? Boom, and it knocks out this current that is headed for the fast tract, but it doesn't knock out the current headed for the slow tract. See where we're going with this? Then there's nobody to, to snuff out the slow tract. And it pops its head out down here, and it splits. Half of it goes this way, and half of it goes, by this time it has repolarized, right? uh, oh, it's all repolarized, it, half of it goes up this way goes, oh, look, let's explore this way. It pops its head out here, splits, half of it goes this way, half of it goes up here, knocks out the SA node. And now we got ourselves a little racetrack. And that, my friends, is AVNRT. It's a racetrack that is using the approach tracks to the AV node. And, I mean, a tiny bit of the AV node is involved in this as well. See how that works. So I think I explained everything. You can read through that. And there's nothing I missed there. All right. So I even got, I went this far. Let's go through it again. How does AVNRT start? Perfectly placed, perfectly timed pack occurs right in front of the fast track. And it hits the approaching SA current and they snuff each other a current uh, uh, they snuff each other out so the fast track gets nothing it no current goes down the fast track but it does go down the slow track right and uh, kind of drew that uh, the PAC knocked out the current here and everything I've already said it goes around in this vicious circle all right everything I said again PAC current goes down, half the everything I said. So you can read through that. But that's what we get. We get this vicious racetrack of current. See how that works? That's AVNRT. What are the EKG findings? They can be very similar to AVR or AVRT. Um, the ventricles typically run about 175, usually not quite as bad as AVRT, orthodromic AVRT. Certainly not antidromic AVRT, uh, but they can be just as fast. They could be 225 as well. Um, it's a narrow complex tachycardia, so it, you're not going to have a really long QRS complex like you do with antidromic AVRT. You can tell it apart from a junctional tachycardia because it's faster, 175 beats compared to 125 beats for a junctional tachycardia. So that's really the only way you can tell. Um, it could, comes on paradoxically, could come on from, like we said, from alcohol or stress or things like that. And it's easy to confuse with junctional tachycardia and orthodromic AVRT. Right? And it's not usually going to overrun the ventricles where it's going to wreck your heart really fast. Uh, the P waves are typically inverted, so these P waves don't usually show upright, and that's a little different because in AVRT it depends where the hole in the fiber skeleton is. So if you see a, an upright P wave in one of these tachycardias, eh, it's pro in its narrow complex, it's probably coming. Uh, it's probably AVRT because this one uh, they're typically inverted. Um, they, of course, don't show up before the QRS complex. I don't even have to put, none of them do that. But it can be hidden. About 50% of the time it's hidden. The other 50%, it likes to distort 
that S wave. So it can slur or notch the S wave just like a junction tachycardia can do and just like AVRT can do. Okay, it's narrow complex. We said there's no current sneaking ahead of schedule. You're not going to see a delta wave on this. Um, so here is a... Uh, and, and here's another thing, though, that you can tell it apart from AVRT. If you can see, if you're lucky enough to see the tracing where it starts, so here we have a normal beat, a normal beat, and you can see the pack occur, um, th and then there's a tachycardia right after a pack occurs, um, that's, that's probably an AVNRT. Because usually AVRT is started by a PVC, and that makes the a crazy looking QRS complex, which we didn't get into. I have YouTube videos on PACs you can or PVCs you can watch if you want. Um, but so that can sometimes be a clue if you can see a and, and you can see this is a pack. Look at the normal size. So that's the normal SA generated P wave, and that's much bigger, right? So that's got to be a pack. And then we go into a tachycardia after it. There's a little dent here, uh, maybe a pseudo S wave or a notched S wave. So the S wave looks a little funky as well. Let's do a case. So 53 year old enters with sync pre syncope. So it he means he's kind of feels like he's going to faint. He's got some middle back pain. He ha was diagnosed with COPD. Uh, you run an EKG. And let's see what we see. Here's what we see. So it's not irregularly irregular. I can see, I don't see a squiggly line, so it's not, it's not atrial fib. Uh, let's get a measure on these. Let's see, is one of these now? They're, they're all not very easy. This is actually 2.5 little boxes, so that would be 300. Looks like it's about 150 beats per minute. Can we see a P wave? Uh, we can see a funky looking R wave right there. Yeah, so that's a notched R wave or a slurred R wave. So um, it's between junctional tachycardia and AVRT or AVNRT. It's definitely not antidromic AVRT. So um, because it's faster than 120, it's probably AVRT or AVNRT. I couldn't give you both answers because they can both do that. Differential diagnosis is AVRT. Um, because AVNRT is the most common, then um, you would go with AVNRT. AVRT is second most common. AVNRT is most common. Right, so maybe a little too fast for junctional tachycardia. Let's do another one. This is a little easier. Well, no, maybe it's not. A 49-year-old developed dyspnea and palpitations after a basketball game. And then continued for four hours. They went into the ER. Has a history of hypertension. Has been battling hypertension. And we got about 150 heart rate again. That would be, yep, about 100. Miss a hair under 150. Um, there's no P wave. There's no squiggly wave, so it's not atrial tech, or it's not atrial fibrillation. There's no P wave. The P wave is you can see it's notched in here, so it looks like there's a P wave notched in there. Um, again, 150 is a little fast for a junctional tachycardia, um, so it's either AVRT or AVNRT. Quite hard to tell the difference between those two. Strong differential because AVNRT is more common. I would go with AVNRT. All right, uh, treatment for all of these things: the vagal maneuvers again. Um, as long as you don't have that wide complex tachycardia, they're okay to do. So you can do it. Could trim. Now here's the key. This is why I put this because we've already talked about this. Why are you putting this in again? Because the part of the racetrack is the AV node, the very most proximal portion of the AV node. Vago maneuvers have a chance of actually stopping, not just slowing it down. It has a chance of stopping this and putting your heart back into normal sinus rhythm. 
So that's the key with uh, these maneuvers. Um, so about 19, almost 20% of the time, just by any one of the Valsalva maneuvers or the Vagal maneuvers, you can, which we've already talked about, you can stop this. So that's cool. It's not true with AVRT, and it's not true with atrial tachycardia or junctional tachycardia. Well, junctional tachycardia, um, no, it typically doesn't work because that's not a re-entry tachycardia, so it doesn't work on that either. All right, what are the symptoms? Pretty much the same as all the others. Palpitations, anxiety, maybe some dizziness. Uh, if it's really fast, you, you could develop chest pain. Any of these tachycardias, if it goes fast enough and your heart's becoming ischemic, you can develop chest pain with these things. Uh, treatment, so you don't have to worry about, uh, about not doing adenosine. So... If the vagal maneuvers don't work, then you go to pharmacological conversion. The most common type of pharmacological conversion is adenosine. And if that fails, you go on to synchronous current electrocardioversion. You usually don't have to use the asynchronous uh, current very well. But adenosine is really successful. It's got almost 100%. I mean, these pit guys say it's a 100% success rate at um, breaking the arrhythmia. So adenosine works really good. All right, that's enough with EKG. We'll look at tiny couple more tracings, but let's get into myocardial infarction. So this is a heart attack or a MI, and this means your your the muscle of your heart is dying. It's it's run out of oxygen, and it's stimulated pain fiber nociceptive afferents, which are sending a message to the brain saying. Uh-oh, the heart is dying. Human, you better do whatever you're doing, you better stop it because you're you're fixing to die, as they say down south. Fixing to die if you don't stop whatever you're doing. And if you're laying in bed, then you can't really stop doing anything. You probably are going to have a full-blown heart attack. Um, but that's uh, kind of talked about the warning signs, but uh, we'll get into that. Yeah, it's it's no good. You you lose a piece of your heart. Your heart is not going to be functioning as well as it used to. Let me take some water here. What's the cause of a myocardial infarction? Well, anything that cheats your myocardium, myocardial muscles out of oxygen. All tissue needs oxygen to stay alive. You cheat your heart out of oxygen, you're going to have a heart attack whether it be just part of the heart or the whole heart or whatever. So any type of beaver dam in the coronary artery, arteries, or one coronary artery usually. What causes a beaver dam in the coronary arteries? Usually atherosclerotic plaque. Uh, but Monkberg's, there's other types. There's three types of athero arterial sclerosis, right? Remember the three types of arterial sclerosis? You should make a note card on that atherosclerosis, Munkberg's medial sclerosis, and arteriolosclerosis. That one's probably not going to do it. But um, What if you get an embolism? And it goes in the ostium for the right or left coronary artery and gets stuck somewhere. That can do it. Um, vasospasm, coronary artery vasospasm, similar to Renaud's phenomenon. Um, that can happen, and that's a problem could completely vasospasm the coronary artery shut. Um, I mean, I could have added ventricular hypertrophy because as the left ventricle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it can crush the verte or can crush the coronary artery, so it can start to beaver dam. So I could have added that in. Uh, decreased oxygen is another thing that can cause. Uh, what if you just get a general decrease of oxygen uh, in the blood? So it's nothing wrong with the coronary arteries, but it's something wrong with the blood. So someone with chronic severe COPD, they don't have enough oxygen. Someone with Eisenmenger syndrome with a left to right, with a pathological right to left shunt, um, those people can, the heart can start becoming ischemic, and you could get a heart attack from that as well. Cardiomyopathy, where the heart, there's many causes of it, but where the heart just doesn't work anymore. And if you don't pump enough blood out of the heart, 
then your heart is not feeding itself enough blood and you, you can become ischemic from that. Or a tachycardia like AVRT or antidromic AVRT where the heart uh, runs 250, 300 beats per minute. You can't, your heart's not pumping blood well at that speed and the heart's going to start to become ischemic and it's a double whammy because the heart is working incredibly hard and it's screaming for more oxygen and that's not available. What's the epidemiology for this? About every 40 seconds someone in the United States has a heart attack. Uh, each year almost 800,000 Americans suffer a heart attack. Uh, 580,000 is the first time, 210,000 is the second time. So it's not uncommon for people to get a second heart attack. The scary thing number is, I was surprised when I put this course together, to find that 20% of myocardial infarctions are silent. The patient has no clue that they're having a myocardial infarction. So that's scary. Um, diabetics are notorious for that. They can't, their nerves are wrecked, so they don't feel things that good. What are some risk factors? Well, anything that clogs up the pipes or encourages atherosclerosis. So poor diet, mutation of LDL receptors, uh, aging, getting old, uh, smoking, uh, cardiomyopathies, chronic stress, hypertension, hypercoagulable state could throw an embolism. Um, did I say cardiac arrhythmias? I could add in there. Uh, atrial fibrillation could throw an embolism. All right. Remember the coronary arteries now? I assume you know these like the back of your hand. You have boards coming. So there's a left coronary artery. It splits to two pieces into a circumflex artery. Sometimes it's called the left circumflexed artery, but sometimes it's just circumflex artery. It wraps around the back. And this is a right-handed coronary. Remember, there's a right and left-handed coronary system. This is the typical right coronary. And you just assume on board questions they're talking about a right-handed system. And then we have the left anterior descending artery here. Uh, on the right coronary artery, it doesn't split right away. It wraps all the way around the back, gives off a right marginal branch. Uh, and then typically it morphs into the posterior descending artery here. I assume you know these. I've asked questions on this slide before. I assume you know these arteries. Um, so, And don't forget that the left circumflex gives rise to the obtuse artery or the left marginal artery as well. Don't forget that the posterior descending, I think you guys call it the posterior interventricular arteries, which nobody calls it in pathology. But don't forget that these communicate the the anterior interventricular artery, is that what you call it? Everybody calls it the left anterior descending artery. They communicate here, so that blood flow communicates. All right, 48-year-old male comes in to the emergency room with diaphoresis. What's diaphoresis? Sweating, chest pain, dyspnea, having trouble breathing. So you, they wheel you down to the, the cardiac catheter lab, they put some dye in your heart, put you under fluoroscopy, and what do you think? See a problem? There's the left circumflex artery, or sorry, that's the left coronary artery. It splits into a left anterior descending artery, and there's the left circumflex artery. Well, we have a fill defect here, so that this region right here is all filled with atherosclerosis. It's almost, yeah, probably a 90% blockage. That's not causing the heart attack, though, is it? But what if we follow this further? I mean, what happened here? That's a complete blockage, right? There's no blood flow there. Um, so that's that's no good. So they have a complete atherosclerotic. They probably the atherosclerotic lesion rupture. That's called breaching. And it completely occluded the vessel right there. And heart muscles dying. Right, so everything I just said, you can read through that. How do you make the diagnosis of a heart attack? Well, there's four components, and the history is important on this one. Physical exam, uh, blood work, and then ECG. Not necessarily in that order. Probably the ECG will be the, one of the first things. After the history, you immediately get an ECG. 
Um, part of the key is what the patient says. The patient typically says, I feel like an elephant is crushing my chest. I'm having trouble breathing. It feels a very heavy pain in my chest. And it's a real pain. It's not a discomfort typically. The pain could radiate down the left arm uh, into the left shoulder, the jaw, the throat, even the mid-back in some people. But the big one is a crushing chest pain with diaphoresis. The patient is sweating. They instinctively know something is wrong and the sympathetics are firing like crazy. Um, just a note again about diabetics and people who are older. Their, their nerves are sometimes damaged. They don't feel pain that well. Um, and in, in diabetics and elderly, it can be very difficult to diagnose a heart attack. About 33% of patients don't have a perfect clinical picture of a myocardial infarction. Um, so it could be easily misdiagnosed with other things that cause chest pain like GERD or peptic ulcer disease or the gastropathies or the esophageal, esophageal dis, uh, motility syndromes or pulmonary embolism. So they can all be confusing. We should talk a few slides about angina pectoris. Um, that is a pre-heart attack. That is chest pain or chest discomfort, which comes on maybe out of the blue, but most likely during some stressful event like sex, having sex, or walking upstairs or doing something you're not used to doing, where your heart works harder and it demands more oxygen, and that oxygen can't be delivered. And the heart will let you know by causing some chest pain. Um, the transient bouts of this myocardial ischemia is not a good sign of things to come. I mean, it could steadily wreck the heart and injure the myocardium. Um, but it, it could indicate that a big, full-blown heart attack is coming very soon. Uh, what is transmitting this pain? It's, it's not peripheral nerves. It's sympathetic and parasympathetic. So its autonomic nervous system is transmitting the pain uh, down these afferent fibers. And you'll remember that the sympathetic system and parasympathetic system with regard to pain transfer, it doesn't do a very good job. So this is why it's common to get pain referred into the arm or into the jaw because the brain's not great at understanding what the sympathetic system is trying to say. Uh, there's two types of angina. We can break that chest pain down. So there's a stable angina which is not really a pain. It's more of a discomfort than anything else. Not a flat out, okay, I got to go to the ER pain. Um, it occurs when the coronary artery is constricted by about 75%. So you have a 75% decrease in blood flow. Uh, and then it could come on paradoxically, or but it usually when you walk up the stairs or have sex or do something that places demand on the heart and it shows up. The key also is it's not, it's usually gone within 20 minutes. All right, so exercise, emotional excitement, psychological stress, excessive heat. Um, and yeah, as we said, the brain's not very good at figuring out where the sympathetic pain is coming from. So this pain can refer into the right arm and the jaw and even the mid back the xiphoid region sometimes so but it's typically described as is a pressure and it's not a real horrible pain um, very commonly is confused with with GERD symptoms like you can get a burning around your sternum with this but the key is it goes away in 20 minutes okay it's not considered classically to be a real pain uh, where does it refer uh, so the precordial region you could get the pain right over your heart where you're supposed to. Um, you might get it in the T1 dermatone on your left arm. So that's basically your left arm. Not so much down into your forearm or hand. Uh, it could be esophageal type pain. Could be a posterior or an anterior cervical spine pain. They may come into your office thinking they need an adjustment or they have hurt their neck somehow. Could be into the jaw or the mandible uh, and then the epigastric region. So you can, it can be all over the place. So what is the treatment for stable angina? Well, you're typically going to take nitrostat. You're going to take some vasodilator, which you can take, and it opens up the size of those coronary arteries and lets more blood flow. So some type of nitrate. 
common one is nitrile stat. Now we come to unstable angina. You're having a real heart attack when this occurs. Um, so sometimes it's called crescendo angina. Uh, when it just it gets worse and worse and worse and it doesn't go away in 20 minutes. And this is a pain. You're going to go or you're going to want to think about going at least to the emergency room. You should call the ambulance. Uh, give them an adult aspirin and call the ambulance. This is a real pain. Classically, again, described like an elephant sitting on the chest. Could come out of the blue. Could come through some exertional event. Um, it's typically caused by atherosclerosis. Uh, one of the coronary arteries is so filled with atherosclerosis that it breaches and the artery is completely beaver dammed. And that region downstream is going to die. Embolism could do the same thing. Um, sudden cardiac death syndrome. Um, yeah, myocardial infarction is a cause of sudden cardiac death. That means the myocardial is so ischemic um, that the conduction system, the Purkinje system, and the AV node and the, uh, the bundle branches and the myocardial cells, they get so irritated from not having enough oxygen that they think they can run the heart. And you can get a ventricular tachycardia. In fact, that's what usually kills people in a heart attack. It's not the actual damage to the myocardium that kills you. It's the ventricular tachycardia, flutter, or fibrillation. Uh, fibrillation is the worst. That kills you. No blood will come out of your heart if your ventricles are, f are fibrillating. Um, so uh, that's an important concept as well. Okay, there are non-atherosclerotic myocardial infarctions, and I'm not talking about emboli either. Um, these are, when we talked about Raynaud's, we talked about how some uh, people seem to be able to completely close off their medium-sized vessels, like the coronary arteries. So it's thought in a certain percentage um, that some type of vasospasm can close off the artery. All right, so 10% of transmural, what's a transmural MRI or MI? That means the full thickness of the myocardium is damaged. It's, not a, it's, a, it's a severe heart attack. It's a massive heart attack. Okay, uh, what are the causes of a or non-atherosclerotic vasospasm? I guess, a, I guess an embolism would technically anything that's not atherosclerotic related. So an embolism, sure, that would work. Uh, vasospasm of the coronary artery. Uh, from idiopathic broken heart syndrome we've talked about before, um, and cocaine, uh, ephedrine overdoses can do it, an embolism from AFib, or paradoxical embolism, if you have a PFO, uh, vasculitis could do it, cause a beaver dam, so I guess again technically left ventricular hypertrophy could get so big it can squish the arteries as well. I don't know if it's going to completely squish them shut, though. So how do you diagnose, how do you know if someone's having a heart attack between the complaints of elephant on the chest and they're sweating like crazy? Um, oh, I guess we haven't gotten to that, sorry. Um, just a, a point here about how important it is to get to a hospital quickly. Um, heaven forbid, I never go to Gilroy Hospital for anything just has a terrible track record and but if I was having a heart attack and it was rush hour um, I could probably get to Gilroy Hospital in about 10 minutes 15 minutes maybe at the most to get to good Sam Hospital it would probably take me in rush hour traffic even going down the side of the road it's probably going to take me 45 minutes to an hour I would probably go to Gilroy Hospital uh, why is that uh, because time is myocardium, as cardiologists say. Uh, you need to get into the cath lab and get the blockage taken care of immediately, preferably within 25 minutes. If they can reestablish blood flow, uh, even in a severe clot, uh, it will save the, the myocardium. A lot of it will come back and not die. If you go beyond 25 minutes or beyond 30 minutes, your heart's probably going to be permanently d 
dead or that part of the tissue is. So to restore blood, that's called reperfusion. Um, there are reperfusion treatments like uh, some medications, thrombolysis, angioplasty, stent placement, coronary bypass. I took a bunch of slides out because we just don't have time to get through this. But how do you make the diagnosis now of a myocardial infarction? Uh, well, the symptoms, crushing, elephant on my chest. The pain's been going on for more than 20, more than 30 minutes. Sweating, they have diaphoresis. A vomiting, nausea and vomiting are common uh, with uh, certain types of heart attacks, especially ones that in the posterior inferior ventricle seem to stimulate the vagus, and that can cause those symptoms. Dyspnea from pulmonary congestion might be happening. We can look on EKG. Let's look quickly at uh, a STEMI myocardial infarction, which shows up. Maybe the very first sign is a Q wave. Uh, the Q wave should always be able to fit in one little box. Some authors say two little boxes with regard to amplitude or voltage and one little box with regard to duration, but it should be darn small. If it's bigger than that and the patient has chest pain, they're probably having a myocardial infarction. So let's take a look at the 66-year-old with chest pain uh, and diaphoresis after a marathon. What do you think of this? Take some water while you examine this. Look at limb lead one. Now look at limb lead three. Right? Oh, good. Some of you caught this. Got two problems going on. But let's talk about the heart attack first. There's the Q wave. So it's definitely tiny. So that's not a problem. There is the up limb of the R wave. There's the down limb of the R wave. Where's that supposed to go down to? It's supposed to go down to at least the isoelectric line, right? Does it? No, it's hanging up here in the wind. So the S wave is, there's not really much of an S wave in this patient. So this is no good. This is an elevated QR or a uh, an elevated QRS segment, or SRST QRS. It's an elevated ST segment, right? It should be way back down here, and it's not. Uh, so this is no good. This is a STEMI, ST segment elevation MRI, or MI, uh, myocardial infarction. You can tell my brain's about had it for today. All right, so no good. What else is going on here? This is a good quality EKG. What's that? Why is that squiggly? Yeah, it's fine atrial fibrillation. So the patient's got AFib going on at the same time. All right. There's the answer to that. One more and we're out of here. 52-year-old uh, enters your office with chest pain, sweating. I mean, just call the ambulance. Chest pain and sweating, call the ambulance. Can't catch his breath. You run an EKG. What do you think here? What in the world is going on now? So remember, you got to look at all your limb leads. There's one. There's two and three are the best ones for looking at the Q wave. What in the world has happened here? So by definition, there's the P wave. PR segment. The first downward deflection is the Q wave. It should never be more than at least two little boxes with regard to vertical height. I mean, that thing is like ten boxes. That's a gigantic Q wave. And if that doesn't grab your attention, so if that's the Q wave, here's the up limb of the R wave. Down limb of the R wave, there's no real S wave. So ST segment is elevated. So this is a STEMI myocardial infarction that has both findings, an enlarged Q wave and an elevated ST segment. The fun fact about this, I took this out, but this will never go away. This will always be on your EKG. The ST segment elevation, as your heart is reperfused and recovers, this will go back to normal, back to baseline. This is going to be with you. You'll never be able to pass an EKG once you're once the Q wave has been damaged. 
All right. Um, and yeah, there's just another huge Q wave in a patient. This one didn't really have a STEMI myocard infarction, but this, uh, in about 15 minutes after this was taken, uh, they did have ST segment elevation. So this may be one of the first findings. It could also mean that the patients had a prior myocardial infarction too. So you have to, if maybe they're they're not having a heart attack. If they don't have any chest pain, you're just doing a pre-employment physical and say, oh my God, he's having a heart attack. No, he's got a history of heart attack. That's just left over from last time. What's the first thing I'll leave this? I think this is, no, we got a couple more slides. The very first thing that you do when someone's having a heart attack or you think they're having a heart attack, give them one adult aspirin, 325 milligrams of uh, salicyclic acid or just an aspirin, right? Um, can a chiropractor give somebody an aspirin? I asked Dr. Snow that one time, and that's kind of a gray area, but I would not hesitate to give it to his daughter, let the daughter physically give it to him, um, because that's going to stop the blood clotting and maybe slow down some of the heart damage if you can get an aspirin in them right away. Uh, when you get to the, the they're going to take blood when you get to the ER, do an EKG and take blood. They're going to run it for different troponins, Troponins should be low. When, you're, when you have a heart attack, the myocardial cells explode and they release different types of troponins, and those can be detected. I used to go into the weeds on these, but just remember the word troponin. There's no star here, but I guarantee I'm going to ask you about elevated troponins. It's a bad sign. Treatment and prognosis, I mean, we've done so well since the 1960s. The in-hospital death rates were... 33% back in the 60s, and now they're down to about 5% because we of treatment and we know so much about this condition. What are some factors, that's a good question, what are some factors associated with poor prognosis for having a myocardial infarction? Elderly people don't do well. Females don't do as well as males for some reason. People who are diabetic uh, and people who have had prior myocardial infarctions, these are all risk factors for a poor prognosis. And then the one hour rule, when do you really worry? That first hour, 50% uh, of the deaths that occur with an acute myocardial infarction occur within one hour of the onset of chest pain. So if you can make it past hour, that's a good sign. And therapeutic intervention be, beside blood thinning techniques, you'll give them morphine, which will help their breathing and decrease their pain. This is incredibly painful. And then there's reperfusion therapy, where you can use uh, streptokinase or fibrolytic drugs to, to break the clot down. Um, you can take them down to the catheter lab uh, and kind of roto root out the clot. Aspirin are given, heparin is given. Um, mechanical reperfusion is done down in the lab. Um, there's, you can use an older technique called balloon angio uh, angioplasty. But now they use a technique called angi uh, aspiration angiojet thrombectomy and stenting. And I have YouTube videos on that that you can watch at those links. All right. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.